Welcome back to the 411 on Wrestling Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Bubble. Uh, with me uh, once again is uh, Ian Hamilton, of course, from 41 Mania. It does all of our uh, coverage, New Japan, and much more, which uh, you can find all of Ian's stuff over on the website. And as usual, we will link uh, to his page here in the show notes of this episode. But Ian, it's been a while, uh, but uh, I think the reason is uh, New Japan has been has had quite a interesting year, to say the least. and Things only got uh, even more interesting and newsworthy uh, after uh, the G1 Climax uh, came to an end. Yeah, I mean, the theme of this year is G1 is Max for Max, but no, but New Japan this year just seems to be thoroughly snake bit. You know, we, you know, we start with G1 with you know, one of the top stars, maybe one of the tournament favorites, you know, injured legit, and you end it in you know, tragically similar circumstances. Yeah, it's... Um... Uh, yeah, let's just start with the G1 because that's where all the all the attention has been. And we knew, I mean, you and I, you know, just messaging back and forth, just talking about the, the G1 lineup before it was even announced. Uh, everyone knew this was not going to be, it wasn't going to feel like your normal G1. And I think we kind of saw that as the tournament went along. There were good matches and, and don't get me wrong. There's plenty of, you know, there, there's certain matches you can pick from and go back and watch and it'll be a very entertaining experience. But it just never, I think, I mean, from the beginning, right, with the Naito injury, uh, and then, of course, that kind of started it all, and then to end it all the way that it ended with legitimately the final match of the tournament, uh, ending with, with Kota Bushi um, going up for the Phoenix Splash and then uh, getting injured, and as New Japan announced on, I guess that would be Thursday, Friday, today, um, that he had uh, suffered a separated shoulder Obviously, they called off the match right away, and Okada wins the G1. Uh, don't know what that would have looked like. I think a lot of people thought that Okada was going to win from the start. Don't know that that changed anything based off the injury, but like you said, you talk about a, a snake-bitten promotion. That match uh, sort of encapsulated, I think, all of that, just with how everything ended. I mean, going in, like, you know, the field we had for G1 was the second year we've had, you know, COVID restrictions. We knew that the field wasn't going to be anywhere near the strongest we would see. I mean, that like Tomohiro Ishii, he was over. Oh, sorry, Tommy Ishii was doing strong, but he wasn't. It wasn't part of G1. But he had like Minoru Suzuki, Jay White, uh, Will Osprey. They were all you know, completely gone from you know, G1 contention. And you know, we were people you know calling maybe get um, you know some of the you know someone from outside of New Japan, you know, bring put some of the juniors in. Now if that happened, and you ended up with G1, which was good, but the problem is when you've had you know, 31 of them, it's a big problem is a lot of people compared to G1s of old. I mean, only for five, six years ago, you had the Kenny Omega, Kazuchika Okada G1. This you know, pales in comparison. Not in a good way either. Right. No, it it didn't. And I mean, I guess, you know, you always you review all of these for the site. And I know we've talked or going back to last year, you know, just kind of looking at it. Was, it felt like it was much different. But now, like, as you look back, um, you know, before we get into all the other stuff, I think to me, if you if you try to find the positives of this G1, I think and it's kind of ironic because one of the things you and I talked about, you know, I guess a year or so ago now was about Jeff Cobb and where things stood for him in New Japan. And I think there was always that notion that there was there was more. Like, you could get more out of him, whether that's from New Japan side, whether that was from Jeff Cobb's side. It just felt like there was much more to be accomplished for him. And I thought, without question, you know, all the way building up to, to the final uh, there in the block with, with him and Okada, I just thought this was sort of that shining moment, which we've seen from Jeff Cobb, I think, over this year or so now, as we've started to see him uh, kind of, you know, evolve into who he is now. But I just thought this was a very, uh, very good showing from Jeff Cobb. And it's clear now, I think, even though, you know, they didn't go all the way here, but for him to run through the block like he did before Okada, um, it's clear that New Japan at least has uh, clearly some confidence in him at this point. And I mean, sometimes the obvious story is the best one. You know, we had. No, Cobb and Okada, you know, they have two matches pretty quick on top of each other this year. It was obvious when they were both in the same block, it was all going to build to that finale, especially once you know, found out on the final night, those two were paired together. So, so I, you know, I was expecting at the start that it was going to be either neck on neck 
and they would be, you know, that would be the final match. Okay, they try and threw in something with Kenta to maybe force the pace, something with Evil as well. Thank God that didn't happen. But, you know, again, like I say, the simple story is all the best ones. And me, the fact they had Cobb beat the first guy to hit, was it 16 points yeah. in a G1 block? You no, know, I mean, okay, you know, who knows in five, 10 years' time we'll have you know, 20, whatever, how many uh, men in G1 block, but be the first to hit in this current format. That, you know, the you know, badge of honor, that's the kind of thing we'll put on his resume you know, almost going forward. The uh, fact that he didn't win block overall, yeah, neither he nor there. I mean, one of the things I was hitting on the last few nights of the report was that the G1, as it stands now, as long as New Japan are doing you know, multiple nights of Wrestle Kingdom, doesn't really seem that special anymore. You know, years gone by, you had the month-long tournament you know, where you had guys working block matches one night and hundred cards the next night, so they were literally working pretty much every night of the month, and the end reward was the main event of the biggest show of the year. Now, a okay, spoiler for anyone hasn't been hit long enough, the card of one B one, but he's going was he gonna main event one of the two Tokyo Domes or is he gonna main event third night? Yeah. Yeah, it, I mean that's a very good point and, and it brings up a lot more questions because like you said, it's not it's not that one spot anymore where you know you're getting that main event on that one night at Wrestle Kingdom. Now you've got three nights to work with this year, and not just that, but you know they're a little spread out when you think about where the, the third night is at. So it, uh, it the setup is much different, and and I think that it is something that's going to be interesting to see how they go about this. Uh, you know we've we've seen the the double da- gold dash and all that, and we know it's going to be much different this year. Uh, but you know some of the other highlights, and then we will get to the, I guess the second maybe or probably the biggest, most uh, newsworthy item coming out of just the G1 climax final itself um, in a second. But when we look at the the tournament as a whole, I think Zack Saber Jr. with someone else, of course, got off to a great start. Um, I think that you know a lot of people were hoping that perhaps you know some people were making that push. Maybe he gets that opportunity. I didn't never really thought that they were going to go that direction. I guess even with such a hot start, you always felt like that Ibushi was probably going to have a good chance. Um, you know, there was always the option, I suppose, of having Shingo win and doing that story, you know, as the champion and all that. But, I mean, Zack Sabre Jr. here, it just, uh, we know what we're getting. We've talked about him before. I mean, you, you know what you're getting out of him. You're going to get consistency. You're going to get what he brings to the table. Um, but this was another one where, kind of like Jeff Cobb, but in a different manner, you saw this as, all right, we're going to give him that shine here, uh, and then, you know, I guess we can go ahead and transition into uh, the big sort of spot that he was put into uh, in terms of the uh, return of Shibata, who comes back for the five-minute exhibition and just shocks everyone. Um, that was quite a moment, but I guess we can kind of tie those two in together uh, when you talk about Zack Sabre Jr., what he did in this she won and the return of Shibata. Yeah, so with Sabre, my uh, big expectation, and I think I said this as much in a preview, my expectation of him and Taichi were to you know, come to trade wins and losses, so maybe past five, you know, 500, maybe a little bit over, and set up a you know, type challenge with Taichi, you know, that kind of happened towards the end. Uh, with Sabre, I think, obviously there was clearly something they knew going in with uh, Naito with the injury. Um, they parlayed that into him going on that hot streak. But yeah, he was always one of those, in my mind, as long as, as, long as he was tag champion, there was no way he was going to go the whole distance. You know, as much as I you know, wanted to you know, you know, cheer him on, be the first bit to you know, win the G1. I think the problem with, with Sabre, in a sense, well, is he's been, you know, in the most pre show promos, he's been tag guy for how many years now? Yeah. And New Japan don't just pluck somebody out and say, oh, hey, uh, tag champion, you're now main eventing the, you know, one of our biggest shows of the year. You know, it was a nice uh, fantasy, but I think, you know, looking where we are now, you know, October 22nd, you know, our realist uh, glasses on, that was never going to happen. I mean, yeah, great if, you know, they lose tag championships in, you know, whenever and push ahead for you know, maybe 2022 even. Could end up being part of that main event scene. But we also got to remember, you know, it's New Japan, they... And, you know, 18 months of pandemic where they could have tried new people on top. Um, Sabres only just started to flirt that mix, just things are starting to come through. Um, I don't want to say that maybe the best it's going to be for him in terms of you know, New Japan's uh, singles rank, but you know, it's a hell of a time anyway. Yeah, it is. And, and I mean, it's just like you said, it 
it, it's a very interesting dynamic because you mentioned like when you have a guy that goes from being in the tag spot and being slotted there, especially I think in New Japan, whereas, you know, when we compare it to other promotions, we know how quickly that can turn. But I think it, it is something that it takes much longer maybe for them to push it in that direction rather than just taking them right away from that tag. So, all right, we're going to just push you all the way to the top. That is that is not something we've seen very often, and uh, I do think that's a that's a very good point on that. And then, like we said, in terms of uh, Zach, he was in that spot with Shibata, who makes the return. I mean, you talk about the the emotions, and I think the commentary was a great part of that. Of course, you know, for me, listening to the English commentary with with Kevin Kelly and Chris Charlton, and just to, I mean, just to hear. You know, that that actual genuine reaction to people that are just completely surprised by this, because, again, I don't know how any of us would have went into this thinking that we were going to get this scenario that played out with Shibata coming in. They do the five minute exhibition uh, with Zach. And I mean, what a moment, because I mean, of course, everyone probably listening to this, if you have interest in New Japan and the G1 and such, you know how significant Shibata's injury was. And for him now, we don't know exactly what the future is going to look like. We don't know, you know, when that match, if that match, any of that. But to actually see this play out the way that it did, and we were talking about sort of that spark that New Japan needed, they got it with this. Unfortunately, as we know, later in the night, uh, things would change with the Ibushi injury. But um, this was this was one of those moments that you're you're not really going to forget just based on the whole entire story uh, that built up to this here. I mean, you think, you know, four years ago, be, you know, G1 Climax 27, you know, literally months after that injury, you know, with put on the shelf, came back out during the interval. You know, this was kind of mirroring that, you know, the second half the final started, you know, Sabre coming out. Uh, very conspicuous, perhaps, from the card. I know they kind of pushed away well, Tai Chi's, you know, uh, taking time off. You know, Suzuki wasn't on the card, you know, Suzuki's still in America, so really, if Sabre's going to be booked on the finals, it was either going to be in the final, which obviously out the window or the spotlight race. Um, yeah, I mean, nobody, absolutely nobody would have expected Dirt Spotter coming out. Even to do commentary, I would say, like, there's no hints or anything like that. And from all reports I've seen, it seems to be one of those things where he'd been lobbying for ages. Uh, it seemed to be very much a, you know, an 11th hour decision kind of thing. Um, the fact that he came out, he was literally doing you know, nothing but Grappling, I think there was you know, uh, Chris Charlton, you know, said originally you would do rules, correct yourself, uh, grappling rules. But yeah, I mean, just the fact that Chabot is in the ring, you know, from, he was definitely trying to prove somebody that, look, he can still go. Now, the big difference between doing a five minute, you know, grappling spectacular and, you know, the matches that we saw from him, you know, five, six years ago. Um, personally, you know, if he, you know, he comes in just doing like these grappling exhibitions, yeah, it'll get old, but at the same time, I will not be a you know, central or anything like that. But I think with Shabbat, the fact he needed surgery just to stay alive. Yeah. So this isn't always you know, one more bad bump, he's paralyzed kind of deal. In fact, he needed you know, you know, major surgery to stay alive. I'd want to see maybe easing a little bit slowly. I mean, even if it's just for you know, grappling exhibitions, maybe I've always been hit in the head. You know, he's taken a bad bump, that kind of thing. But I do know that. With this, it's not going to be a situation where they can let him in and not take the kind of um, kind of stuff he used to do. One, they're not going to allow that. Two, I think as well. Bearing in mind, you know, we had you know, just on the same show, you no know, Bushi, you not know, getting seriously injured, you no, know, not much derailing the whole the whole tournament in the end of the way they wanted to do it. I don't think they want to play with fire with that. But you know, again. I don't want to say new fans desperate, but you know, looking some of their attendances during this tournament. You know, it could be one of these things, you know, desperate people do desperate things. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that I know we've talked about it before in terms of like people talk about the guys who come back from these career ending injuries, like the guys that you don't ever really imagine that are gonna come back and, and wrestle again. And I guess if we use, you know, the North American versions of obviously there's there's guys like Edge and, and Brian Danielson and kind of what they came back from with neck, you know, concussion issues, those types of things. And, you know, when you look at this, you said it, I mean, we're talking, and this is not to certainly downplay any injuries of any of the other guys, but we're talking about a situation where like it was a emergency sort of scenario that played out with Shibata. And we know now, especially in this era, 
which is obviously a great thing based on where it used to be. Um, you know, and, and you just kind of look at anything with the head, neck, anything like that. Like that is just something that I don't know. Like even the Abushi thing, I thought about this when it happened. Was like, isn't it? It's so wild to me that more of that doesn't happen. Like we see it happen, and and again, maybe it's just because it's a G one final, and you're thinking, well, this isn't going to happen. You know, in this magnitude of a match, but it is incredible how thin that line is when it comes to these types of injuries and things that can end your career or, you know, keep you out for six months, a year or whatever. Um, and I know that's kind of a, a long roundabout, round, roundabout way to get back to Shibata, but it's like, these are some of those things that that is like that line is so thin because we are talking about a physical, you know, competition here that involves a lot of very sort of strategic maneuvers that one wrong thing, as we've seen again, with all the guys we mentioned, that have had these types of just significant injuries, obviously Shabbatas was taken to a different level. Um, but it is incredible that when you think about that, that my goodness, for guys who can come back and be able to perhaps, you know, get back on that road to having these matches or getting back into things the way that perhaps a Shibata does, like we've seen an edge and, and Brandt Danielson do. Um, and then we talk about the Ibushi injury, like, it's still wrestling, right? Like it's not, I mean, we everybody laughs about the whole, you know, wrestling's fake thing and all that over the years, but it's like, this is still wrestling and these things happen and um, you're just not going to take any chances with that kind of stuff, especially in this era. And I think as well, like, you know, we've seen with Shabazz, you know, they were really, you know, not punched to do. I mean, that could be, you know, they sent him off to LA to head up the LA dojo, but was maybe Simon that was as much they willing to let him test the water. Like, look, you know, if you're going to train people, yeah, you're going to you know, be involved in some physicality, but at the same point, you know, if your job is training these guys, you aren't going to do anything which is going to incapacitate yourself. Um, you know, just you know, just for the sake of you know, showing that you're you know, mentally ready, that kind of thing. Um, I do think that the big issue that you're going to have with you know, Shabash, if they do um, bring them back on this, is you know, how, how do you weave so many kind of storyline? I mean, yeah, they had the Kenta stuff a few years back, which you know, seemed to get dropped really quickly once they you know, kind of figured out he wasn't getting cleared. Yeah. But even then, it's like, what, you know, they, bear in mind, they were very careful about those five minutes. It was just dropping, no bumps. It was you know, not even any you know, butch wave strikes. How on earth do you move from that in October 2021 to, I've seen people say, oh, no, he's coming back to Tokyo Dome next year. That's only two and a bit months away. Yeah. So unless they've deliberately, you know, played, you know, played a bit slow, you know, let him, you know, give the impression he's only capable of going, say, you know, you know, two out of ten when he's really capable of it, nine or ten or what have you, fair enough. But, you know, and I, you know, I feel a bit bad to make this connection, but we saw in the same tournament, the same night, what happens when you rush somebody back, you know, as people suspect was the case for Bushi. Well, and it sets up, and I know we kind of talked about this a minute ago. You talk about the Tokyo Dome and Wrestle Kingdom, and obviously we have the three nights now, and it makes it much harder, I think, to predict the direction you're going in. But, I mean, the way that we look at this now, knowing that it is, and, and you just said it, like, it's it's not that far away. Like, it is almost the end of October. Like, we are not that far away from Wrestle Kingdom. And knowing that Ibushi, I mean, a separated shoulder, I haven't looked it up. I can't think off the top of my head how long that, that maybe keeps someone out. Um, but again, yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's kind of one of those things, but like you said, like you're still, you felt like you rushed, maybe perhaps rushed this guy back in the first place. And, um, see, it's just, I think about all the scenarios that could play out now and it's like, well, where do they, where do they go from here? I mean, we know Okada, we know the setup there. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, you've got Shingo as the champion. You've still got Osprey out there, which I assume will probably factor into this in some way, shape, or form. Um, we talked about the Ibushi injury. I, there's a lot of possible scenarios, and I guess that, you know, they will have their pick of what to do, but it is much more of a cloudy picture, I think, just based on how we've seen things play out over the last month or so uh, heading into those three nights at Wrestle Kingdom. Yeah, I mean, no. You know, we you know, kind of talk on the Bushi stuff. So, you know, the injury event, main event, well, it was the main event, went to Phoenix, splash, splash landed, head in his arms and wrists. I think initially Kevin Kelly suggested it was kind of like the Eddie Guerrero broken elbow on Raw years back. 
Yeah. Um, or sorry, SmackDown, whichever the shows was. Um, you know, Seth now it's been a dislocated shoulder, which you know, kind of explains why Bushi wanted to, you know, pop it back in. Apparently had the same injury in the 2010 Best of Super Juniors final, which you know, again, came back next year and won it. But I suppose that's the kind of thing with any kind of wrestler. There's that mentality of you know, the show must go on, even to the point where you are literally wrestling with you know, one arm. Um, I mean, I'm glad that it's, I say, just a dislocation. I mean, being a broken arm or broken wrist or whatever, and what worse, it could have been a lot more serious. I think, in terms of where you can go now with it, I think you've just got to bite the bullet and not any part of wrestling because. We saw with this with uh, we had the was it the um, aspiration pneumonia. We know that ruled him out of the uh, not met the July Tokyo Dome show, but yeah, one of the July shows. Um, from that they scratched the match with Shingo, and he came back you know, a week or two before the G One started. Yeah. And even then, I remember you no know, folks, uh, it's Mark Buckley from does who's been doing coverage for Pulse, saying he didn't look hundred percent. Like that match, I think with uh, Tanahashi went like 15, 16 minutes in the main event. When you, know, you expect New Japan main events, better or worse, have been you know, touching the half hour mark more often than not. Um, yeah, I mean, first few matches, he I don't want to say he looked out of shape, I mean, far from it, but definitely there was a you know, spot where you could tell there was an edge missing. And you know, towards the end of the tournament, he was getting it back. But you know, at the same time, you know, when you've been out for Looking now to his uh, cage match, um, it was last match against uh, Yota Suji before he went off to England in July. Two months back, uh, met live at home against uh, Tanahashi, and then from the 4th of September to now, 12 singles match, uh, 11 singles match. So that's a lot for someone who's been now for two months, you know, with you know, basically yet uh, not pneumonia, as sort I've of said. Yeah. And it's like you've got someone who's used to going full pelt and all of the gym, I mean, not the shape he's in, you know, by accident, and then taking two months off in force. You know, that will do any, will do a big number on you, even if it's a case of, well, you have a month out when you start training that second month. Um, I absolutely don't want to say, oh, well, he, you know, they rushed him back, he got injured because of that. But there is definitely something to be said for just the mental state of, you know, you've had two months out and all of a sudden you're back into, hey, guy. Uh, hey, coach, we need you in the main event. Uh, you know, we need to you know, do the big comfort behind story in the G1 and you know, potentially win it. You know, unspoken or not, that is a, you know, a big pressure to put on yourself. And again, I'm not saying that that played into this, but you know, just the whole setup and knowing what coach can be like, it's the kind of thing where you know, maybe, if, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we should have gone with someone up in him in this spot. And if he, you know, See how, he, see how he recovers through the rest of you, through power struggle, through you know, what have you. And if they want to have a main event at Wrestle Kingdom, well, great, you've got three nights of it. You could have gotten there another way if that was the story you needed to tell. Well, and you said talked about power struggle. I mean, the road to power struggle starts this weekend, and you and I talked before we started recording about, you know, you mentioned there's really not a whole lot to go off of right now. You don't really know what you're going to get yet. And I, I mean, obviously we talked about everything with Ibushi and certainly that's going to factor into that in terms of probably uh, some things being maneuvered around without question. Um, but I guess you know, maybe we get a, a much better idea of where things go. Um, once we, we start to see what the direction is going to look like on the, you know, the road to power struggle, which, um, you know, power struggle will be November 6th. So that's obviously not that far away uh, either at this point. So, I guess that's going to raise a lot of curiosity. Um, you know, then you get into the World Tag League, Best of Super Juniors and all that uh, throughout November and December. But before we put a bow on the G1, anything else that stood out to you? I mean, this was, as we talked about from the start, like this was a G1 that featured, um, you know, people in there that probably in a normal year you're not going to see in the G1. And I think that was obviously going to be something that, you know, brought about some concern in terms of match quality for people and wondering, you know, how this G1 was going to play out. Um, you know, and this is for me, like it's not knocking any of these people. It's just in a normal G1, you're probably not necessarily going to see uh, some of the lineup here, whether it was Chase Owens, you know, whether it's Tama Tonga, Tonga Loa, um, you know, those types of people 
anything to you that maybe stood out or, or maybe pleasant surprises, uh, disappointments uh, of anyone else, maybe outside of that top tier that we've talked about? Um, yeah, I mean, like say for guys you mentioned, I mean, I would say definitely with G one, while the highs may not have been as high, but lows definitely weren't as low. Yeah. Like, you know, when you pack you know, big you think of like Chase Owens, you know, usual Takahashi, Vagrilla's Destiny, you may think, Oh, you're gonna have I don't say duds, but you know, you're not gonna have a great match. And I genuinely cannot think of that many stinkers in this tournament. You know, the stinkers we had were maybe the Toriano match where you had you know, the five minute comedy act but stretched out beyond 10 minutes because guess what we need to pad these cards out but um i would say nobody on these tournaments or at least their overall performance i don't think anybody made uh you no know, a clown of themselves uh, but again when you know when like say when you look at you know, potentially next year if the japan opens up if they start issuing visas and you start getting more of a fuller strength roster potentially you no know, extradition i mean and with, you know, people talking about being up bidden door well I know there's a few people you know, kind of hoping Brian Danielson is part of the field next year, if that can at all be possible. Um, but yeah, you look at you know, guys there who plugged the gaps this year, I don't get any of them left themselves down. Um, do I think any of these guys would be able to parlay this into anything more substantial? Hell no. I mean, you saw my final show. Oh, Jeff Cobb, okay, maybe the injury or you know, the tape of the neck and shoulder played a part. But he went from being the you know, first guy to 16 points to, you know, I almost furries him up for the opening tag match. You know, same again, you no know, Chase Owens, okay, we've got um Tanahashi and Kent of the US title. You know, probably building up some Chase possibly in the new year with that. But do I see Tangalo and Tamatonga going having any kind of singles one? Not really. You know, is the usual going to be anything more than you know, that annoying guy in the corner and just an entrance to people who you no know, dubbed him? No, probably no more than that. Yeah. Um, so I think it's stuff New Japan's got in their back pocket, but I think in terms of single stuff and bigger picture, we've still got to remember they have, at the moment at least, that one big world title at the top. They don't have the old intercontinental title. We never titles currently on ice because Bay White's out of the country. You know, whether you want to read into, I've heard these issues or whatever you want to call it. Really, this is a company that has one main singles heavyweight title, the junior heavyweight title. Uh, the two sets of tag titles, and I think you know, a lot of these guys who are probably more used to being tag wrestlers, but maybe the way they go back down, especially now, obviously, we've got World Tag League in you know, a couple of weeks' time. But yeah, I mean, it's certainly a lot of stuff that New Japan's got in the back pocket, but unfortunately, nothing actually ever being used in the immediate future. And again, you know, I think that's one of the big knocks on the product at the moment. You know, a lot of the guys, the same spots they're in that, you know, the same spots they've been in for ages, like, you know, Ibushi Okada, you know, they were you know, the main event. You know, Shingo was very, very about the main event. But you've not seen really anybody being pushed up or you know, earned away, or some better word, from where they were. You yeah, we might have had a breakout G1, but both finals really pushed people back into their box they were in six weeks ago. You know, we haven't talked in a, in a while, and this is a subject that people have talked about a lot, but I, I just continue to be absolutely... I don't even know what the right word is. I don't know if it's flabbergasted, but has there been anyone that has experienced such a change in reaction, momentum, direction, this evil stuff? Like, I just, I, I think back and I'm just thinking over the past year or so now, again, everything kind of runs together, I think, based on last year. Uh, you kind of forget, for me, timeline-wise, when, when things happen specifically, but I just keep thinking about this evil stuff and I'm like, what can they do at this point to turn this around? Because I, I don't know that it's, it's been a while, Ian, since I've seen one, seen someone that has just with one wrong move, which obviously we can go back to where they made that move. Um, when they decided to, to do what they did, make the turn and then to play it out the way that they have, I think with the, the bullet club stuff. Um, I just, I cannot even imagine like how quickly things have gone in such an opposite direction for evil. And, and really even watching some of his matches in the G one, like I don't want to say that, you know, obviously that he's, he's talented, but it's like all the stuff that comes along with it. Like, I just, I think back to where he was and again, timeline wise, whatever it was two years ago, um, year and a half, whatever. Um, and I think about where he is now in terms of the actual, like the public reception to him and what people think, and it's just, it's still just, I just find it mesmerizing. 
when you think 15 months ago, you know, the big bullet club heel turn, he was a double champion for a spell. You know, he you know, gave up uh, you know, his share of those Never Trios titles. Now he's you know, seemingly you know, constantly staring at those things. Um, and to you know, borrow something that Prince Devitt said years ago, he better be Captain Fook in New Japan. <laughs> yeah. That's the same kind of thing. Like, he is, you know, this is a guy who not too long ago was in main events. Now, like, okay, he's got his own, you know, the House of Torch, which never has been a more apt name for stable. <laughs> but not a guy who, you know, I don't want to say at any point was he ever, you know, a big name within LIJ. He was always, you know, when it was full strength, Naito, maybe Sonata, depending on you know, Sonata and uh, Hiromu, you know, 2A, 2B, if you want to go down that road. He was never a top guy in my group. And the fact that they plucked him from there and you know, you know, head of a bullet club while everyone was out of the country, that was always a, a really, you know, for real? You serious, guys? But yeah. it was never something that was going to stay. And then the fact that you, you know, have him lumped in with yeah, he's going to be our guy who gets heat. Yeah, well, we've all been doing that for three years, and look how that's uh, reacting to it. Yeah. <laughs> I just, like, I, I think back to, like, I remember, maybe this was, like, I want to say, like, 2019, maybe the 2019 G1, maybe. Um, And I'm just, like, I can just think back to them, because that was, what, but when life was normal somewhat. Um, And I'm just, like, you look at the entrances, like, you see all the stuff, and it's just, like, the people were so into um, everything kind of surrounding him and, and some of the things, um, you know, he had good matches. And, and again, I would have to go back to, to look at some of that, but it's like to think how quickly things have turned for him. It's just, um, it's, it's something. And the more I think about it, I'm just like, wow, that's the case of one wrong move and it can send you so far in the wrong direction. Meanwhile, if we take this on the positive spin, uh, before we wrap up, I mean, Shingo, I think is the, the opposite example. And I think that Shingo, you know, you and I have talked before and and i've always said you know i think that he's always to me been one of the best in the world just based on what he does like you just you know what you're getting out of shingo you're always going to get i think really good stuff and now for him to i I think in the perfect scenario obviously you would have loved to see him you know get that big championship moment in a more normal time outside of maybe having to be the guy that's carried them through again what has just been quite a snake bitten uh, tenure here over the past year, year and a half, whatever. Um, almost, well, I guess, longer than that now. Uh, going back to to March of last year, so it's just, I, I think, with him, you know, as you look at his spot and where he is now. I mean, his title run. Again, you know, you're going to get good matches out of him. Uh, I guess I'm most fascinated with Shingo now moving forward. What does that look like for him now as we do head towards Wrestle Kingdom? You know, he finishes behind Ibushi in, in A Block, but. It's still one of those where I I love the direction they're still going in with him. I wish it was under better circumstances uh, with everything, but I am very curious about maybe the next direction for him uh, going into Wrestle Kingdom, knowing the type of challenges that he could face um, and and all that stuff uh, with Shingo moving forward. I mean, my big fear with Shingo, I mean, obviously with the New Japan Strong and obviously he's been carrying over on the shows in the UK as well. They're clearly building to Osprey and Shingo to unify those belts. And assuming that Osprey can get back to Japan, again, I don't know these issues or what have you, but assuming he gets back to Japan, I can see that being the one for main event. Yep. Um, the cars are up of the old V4, the old belt probably turned it into the hey, draw the wing deagle from your imagination <laughs> design. Um, I think Ocard will be doing the uh, one five main event. And unfortunately, I would not be stunned if we end up with Okada as you know, the champion bidding that you know, the fake wing, wing eagle belt <laughs> on 1 5. And then was it 1 7 1 8 the third night in uh, Yokohama? Who knows? I mean, at this point, you know, this is you know, purely uncharted territory. It's, I think right now, they've really been struggling to pad these big show cards out. Of course, add more matches on them, that's always going to help uh, guys. But yeah, I think Osprey, Shingo, 1 4. I would fully expect um, Shingo maybe to retain on 1 4, lose to Okada 1 5. Um, and who knows, maybe, you know, go back around to Osprey, Okada, and Yokohama, maybe. But I think that's the way I could, I could see it playing out, assuming Abushi's out, assuming they're not going to do. I mean, I know we've had um, Tamatonga, you know, 
don't do the uh, traditional challenge because he beat Ricardo in the G1. Um, I don't think they're going to lose their minds to the extent where you know, Tamatonga wins. You know, don't be stupid. But I think definitely Thomas main event will be around those three guys. And uh, just for the undercard, who knows? It's, there's a lot of shows they're going to do. I mean, I think just between now and the end of the year, there's 33 New Japan shows. Okay, no, a lot of those are going to be Tag League Best of Super Juniors, but yeah, 33 shows with this roster, it's, <laughs> it's going to be a tough one. The power struggle is real. Well, I was going to say, I know the struggle is also real because if there is anyone in the world more excited than Ian when it comes to the big announcement that took place on Friday about uh, New Japan adding more matches. So we're getting back to more matches on New Japan cards. And, uh, you know, I know you're, you're thrilled about that. So a lot of a lot of eight man tags coming back. So, woohoo, yay for everyone. They can have enough people roles. I mean, <laughs> I, what, uh, nothing against I me. Mean, I, I mean, uh, Togi Makabe, you know, he's been missing in action most of the year. I saw him this week, probably early this week. I saw him 20 years ago, nearly to the day when he was a young lion. Um, <laughs> on excursion on a, it was a random wrestling show back in Sunderland uh, when he was touring with uh, All Star, I think it was. It's like, you've got guys there who his 2021 has been most commentated on, not even in the building. And you're bringing him back just to say you're doing a seven, eight match card? <laughs> I mean, I guess you know, maybe it's this whole Bally for Money proposition because. I've looked at those ticket prices for um, the upcoming uh, call shows. Like £55 and £35 pounds equivalent. Those are not cheap tickets for the, you know, the power structure shows. And to my understand, some of those have actually sold out. More power to them. Yeah. But you know, if you're adding extra matches just to say, yeah, we're giving you more for your money. <sighs> no, quality of quantity, guys. You know, it's, and again, with the roster you've got, how snake bit you've got, I think the last thing I would attempt this close to you know, Wrestle Kingdom is having more guys being asked to do more stuff. Um, but again, you know, I'm not the guy who makes the decisions. You know, I'm not the guy who's you know, looking the. I'm not the bean counter who's you know, seeing how much New Japan's having to break even. I mean, if they're saying that you know, they, you know, New, uh, Japan's uh, COVID case is going down and the fact that New Japan hasn't had that much in the way of outbreaks, I know they had that you know, the scary one in the summer with um, Shingo, you know, Others potentially named to affect and take some cards. But if you're looking at the point now where we're saying the numbers are so low, we can get back the way things used to be, I'd potentially you know, work it up and rather than go, hey, we're now going to go back to eight match cards. And, you know. and again, who knows? You know, these you know, seven to eight matches may be thrown in guys from you know, freelance or what have you, but I fully expect these are going to be you know, your Tiger Masks, your Togi Makabase, your Tomoraki Honmas, you know, matches which really, you know, Let's be honest, unless you're watching everything, you're going to be skipping anyway. Yeah, the financial situation is certainly uh, has been something for this promotion over, you know, this entire pandemic. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's clearly a method to what they're doing here. And uh, they uh, I just uh, there is like I can't think of another promotion. We talk about all the twists and turns since this began, um, you know, over a year and a half ago now, and just uh, everything that's, it's just, it's incredible to think about all the different uh, twists uh, that have happened with New Japan uh, during that time. But, uh, yeah, I guess um, outside of uh, that, I mean, that's sort of the state of New Japan right now coming out of the G1 climax. And uh, as we mentioned, the road to power struggle starts this weekend uh anything else i know we, we always talk about it i mean you you do so much more just outside of new japan um you know for the site uh nxt uk you just recently uh, reviewed crown jewel which uh, that's always an interesting discussion in and of itself but uh, anything else that's kind of has your eye here moving forward or anything you want to push uh, before we wrap up um yeah i mean i guess one of the main ones that main portion was really hit the ground running in in the UK at least, you know, coming out well, still in the pandemic. Uh, Ref Pro, they've been doing some really good stuff. Um, I think they've been doing a lot from their tag division, Aussie Open, who want to tie back to New Japan. They've joined the United Empire. Uh, I don't expect, well, they won't be in World Tag League. Um, they're working Ref Pro show as the two is going on, so yeah, that's not going to be happening. But uh, Ref Pro, I think since the big restart this summer, have really hit the ground running. Um, a lot of shows, a lot of content, but a lot of good stuff coming from there. Um, they've got their British J Cup in, I want to say, about two, three weeks' time. Uh, names like Speedball, Mike Bailey, Akira Francesco, 
uh, you know, big names, you know, international as well. So it's not just the, the UK guys. Um, and also WXW in Germany, they you know, start to dial up their schedule, uh, building up to their 21st anniversary show. But I'm hopefully going to be at, as long as COVID doesn't have lockdowns again in Europe. And also they'll be building up to 16 karat gold in March next year. And knock on wood, I'll be going ahead um, as close to full strength as I can do. Yeah, I mean, lots of stuff. Like you said, that's the, I think the, the biggest thing is we're hopefully continuing to see um, a lot more things, you know, start to pick up uh, safely in the, the wrestling world. And um, hopefully that is the direction uh, we continue to go in here uh, moving forward. But as I said earlier, uh, be sure to check out all of Ian's stuff. Uh, I'll have the link to it as always uh, in the show notes. You can check out all the stuff he does uh, on the site. We'll put the link in there to his Twitter as well but uh ian always a fun conversation and uh i'm sure we'll hopefully do this more often uh soon because uh as we said new japan does have a pretty big show here in several months uh, in wrestle kingdom and hopefully um it will be a good road to wrestle kingdom and uh, not one filled with uh, a lot of unpredictable uh, elements as we've seen to this point uh, knock wood take care everyone it's been a pleasure all right, that was uh, Ian Hamilton, and uh, again, we'll put the links to all this stuff in the show notes, and uh, be sure to check out everything we got going on at 41mania.com. Uh, check out our news, reviews, columns, all of that over there, and uh, the fallout from uh, Crown Jewel and all that stuff. We have it all on the site uh, for the WWE audience, and uh, of course, it's another big weekend with AEW uh, having dynamites and uh, all sorts of stuff going on, so check everything out over there be sure to subscribe to the podcast uh any podcast app you use search for 401 on wrestling and uh, as always we'll have the link to the gofundme for larry zonka's family in the show notes so be sure to continue to share and contribute to that if you can and uh, everything else 411mania.com but uh, thanks as always for listening to the podcast and uh, we'll talk to you next time here on the 411 on wrestling podcast <laughs>